uh, I forgot who it was, but now David, oh, I'm the uh, delegate, delegate from Texas, that's right. Yeah, it was mentioned today we had a delegation from Texas, and I'm here to represent one half of that delegation. And just quite frankly, you'd enjoy the other half better. I know I do. She is my bride, the wife of my youth, 42 and a half years, Sister Clara. If you haven't met her, please stand up, honey. And you're, you're like Seth. Uh, she gets hid behind the, the taller people. And I want you to know she's been a joy and a blessing all of my life. I don't have a chance to say uh, these things, so I must take just a moment to tell you that over the last several years, uh, really seven or eight, she and I have set aside a part of our year for the Refreshing Waters Conference, and it, it's just become part of our life, and it's something that we anticipate and we look forward to, and it's very, very moving to us to be here. And, of course, this week has been complemented by the wonderful generosity of the hospitality of this local congregation. And I just, I, I know the effort that goes into putting this together and just quite frank, frankly, you ought to grab several people and give them a big hug. I just don't know which ones it is. You could grab so many, but uh, um, these things just don't happen to have the opportunity to fellowship with this many on occasions as this is so wonderful. It's, a, it's deeply moving to me from my background to be among brethren that are so uh, well educated and can present their case with such intelligence. Uh, this is not common in my background and, and I truly, truly appreciate that. And so here at last, it's come down to me. I, I, the Lord works in mysterious ways, I, I suppose. Uh, you know, so I, I'm resisting the temptation. Dilbert in the comedy strips a couple of days ago was in a dilemma in a seminary. He says, uh, well, here I am, the last speaker, and they already took all the good points, but I'm, I'm going to resist that. I've taken all the good points, and, and I'm going to just proclaim to you I don't care whether you heard it or not, you need to hear it again. It's good for you, and it's even better for me. So I think we're going to win on that occasion. Now, Texans have a little bit of levity. I've had two bosses from Indiana. I like to drove them crazy, but I'll promise you today that they finally had to find out a Texan when he was smiling and laughing could be deadly serious. And so... Uh, our levity does have some humility to it. You should be from time to time subjected to the southern drawl. It's God's way of teaching Midwesterners patience. And, <laughs> and it doesn't hurt some of you to hear from a little different background. And I, from the human perspective, are from that. Clara and I were reared in the Church of Christ. Now in the South, when you say Church of Christ, that means you do not have an instrument. Well, obviously, we're not of the non-instrumental persuasion. We are, do not have an instrument, but we're not against having an instrument, or obviously we would not be here. As a matter of fact, we were raised in, and reared in a Church of Christ background that has nothing to do with the mainline Church of Christ that you even think about. So don't associate me with those. Uh, we are untrained as far as the world standards go biblically, and that doesn't bother us too much. Where I am considered unfit for any pulpit of any recognized movement by man's standards, but that unfazes me, I believe, and therefore I speak. Any time that I have a chance, and if given, or Michael keeps asking me, Lord willing, we'll continue to be here. I do feel from time to time like Amos, jerked up out of the pasture of Tekoa and sent to preach to kings. And I pray that the Lord could use me tonight for a few minutes uh, to speak to you, kings and priests, concerning our gathering together to him. 
2 Thessalonians, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled and alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, a man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you of these things? Now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and will destroy with the splendor of his coming. I'd like to tell you what I get out of this context. There are three things that take place concurrently, the coming of the Lord Jesus, our be gathering together with him, and the day of the Lord, all are mentioned as occurring concurrently. These, this context makes three other things crystal clear. He will return, but he hasn't returned, and his return at that time was not eminently necessary. This context, of course, states that three things has to happen before he returns. There was going to be an apostasy. There was going to be a man of lawlessness arise. And there was going to be a removal of the, what was hindering those developments to take place. Now, I also see, not altogether in this context, at least two of them, but there's one other uh, mentioned by Peter, people develop three ideas about the returning of the Lord Jesus Christ that's always wrong. One is because he hasn't returned, then he won't return. The other one is because he was promised to return, apparently he has already returned. And the other one is because he has promised to return, it's going to be 9 o'clock and you fill in the date. All three, of course, are in error. Peter refutes the first one, say things you may think they're continuing like it always. So today in the days of Noah, bam, it happened. And of course, Paul refutes the other two ideas right in this context here. So I'm left with what is the proper assessment. And I think about Paul's assessment to those people. Don't you remember what I told you when I was with you? Now, Paula wasn't there. So, Leon, I think what you better do is just read what he wrote the Thessalonians before this verse, and you'll have the proper perspective. And I may read one or two of those things to you. But it is never the when. It is always the what. Don't worry about the when, because you can't do anything about it. Worry about the what in the returning, because you can do something about that. So let's read a few of the things that Paul had to say to these Thessalon uh, Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, first chapter, just a few thoughts. Turn from idols, serve the living God, wait for the Son from heaven. He'll rescue you from the coming wrath. So I like this waiting without fear. Oh, as a kid, you always waited in fear. I, it, it was always waiting on something. Uh, from your mother, dad, who's the school teacher, the principal, you're always waiting in fear. But we don't have to wait on the, uh, for the fear of the Lord because he has rescued us from the coming wrath if we turn to idols to serve the living God. In second, uh, second chapter, 1 Thessalonians, he said, remember, remember this, what the whole thing is about. God's called you to his kingdom and glory. You're going to share in the splendor of the Lord. He contrasts that. This is what he contrasts it to. That God's hostility is insured against those that are against him. He's going to have a coming wrath. Therefore, in the contrast, we're going to have a coming splendor. Now, while we're eagerly awaiting, expect his coming glory is Paul's admonition to him. 
In fact, Paul cites the very Thessalonians as his crown and his joy and his glory and his hope. When the Lord comes, these very Thessalonians was going to serve Paul very well. And by the way, those you bring to Christ are the stars in your crown. That works for us as well as it worked for Paul. It's the great sense uh, that Jesus has. We're stars in even his crown. He is who we died for, and he wants to bring us home. Now, the fifth chapter, this coming is sure. Prepare for it. I don't care whether you're dead or alive, he says. The purpose is to get you to live forever with him. And one last passage before we get to our verse. The coming of the Lord and our being gathered together with him. He says this is just one more evidence that God is a just God. And I really like that. You know, in judgment, sometimes as kids we like to say, I told you so. <laughs> well, you can tell the world in the judgment time, I told you so as God vindicates his people. Amen. Our current predicament then is a natural consequence of us being in the world. It's a natural consequence of us being in Adam. It's not the final solution. There remains one final reckoning or gathering, as it's mentioned here. The world's historic end will demonstrate the real justice of God, the unseen realities that have always been true, but then will be made manifest. Here at last, the divine justice of God is on the display for the celestial bodies, for us terrestrial bodies, and from those infernal bodies, we'll all be there and see the justice of God at last. Uh, this gathering will eventuate in perfect harmony with all of the scriptures. There won't be one scripture violated. As a matter of fact, they'll all be perfectly fulfilled. In fact, there is an overriding principle in scripture of gathering by God resulting from or from a previous scattering. It's a general theme in scripture. God has scattered and God is going together. And we need to see this in my few minutes tonight. Scattering, dispersing, exiling, being cast out, all are synonymous terms in scripture. Obviously, you recognize it as a normal consequence of sin. It's exemplified in all the various uh, scatterings of the Jewish tribes as they were carried into their captivities. But it's also exemplified in scripture in many places, just in, in a more significant way, for instance, in, here's an example in Luke 151 in Mary's song. He has scattered those who are proud in their hearts. That's very touching to me. Scatterings happened in Adam. Now, God also, and I wouldn't take a million dollars for this thought. It is worth everything. Scattering in scripture is a demonstration of God's power and his mercy and his love to gather those that have been scattered for the sake of his glory and his name and his honor. And I thank him for that. Now these are principles. They're demonstrated time and time again in historical scripture. It's especially elucidated in the prophets. You go to Zephaniah, Micah, Amos, Joel, Hosea. God scatters and God gathers. And if you remove that from them, you don't have much left in them. That is the principles involved there. The, the Psalms takes it up in a poetic form. Where would the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah, and the book of Ezekiel, what would it be reduced to if you remove God scattering and God gathering? You wouldn't have much left. These are principles of God. And God is telling us throughout these witnesses and other witnesses that this world can expect scattering. It's a result of God's reaction to us and Adam. 
It's a result of sin and death. It's a result of the inability of the flesh to comprehend the ways of God. It's a weakness of humanity. It's simply we got stuck in Adam and you're going to be scattered. But God is also telling us in these same witnesses, he doesn't have to leave and go somewhere else to tell us. These same witnesses say, wait, wait on and expect a gathering. On the part of God, it's always a consequence of his grace and his forgiving nature. On the part of man, every case, every time, no matter what dispensation you want to put it in, on the part of man is always due to his faith. Do you know what God was talking about when Habakkuk said, God said through him, the just shall live by faith? He was talking about a scatter. Habakkuk, God says, Habakkuk made the complaint. He says, what's going on here, God? Oh, let me just grab this. It's a hundred, it's a thousand, page a thousand seven in my Bible. I hope it's close there in yours. But just listen to this word. I'm going to stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. The people were complaining. Habakkuk passed it on to God. God gave him an answer to his scattering. They were about to lose their freedoms. They were about to be scattered into captivity. And the Lord answered him. And without going on all the way down to it, he says, Habakkuk, let me tell you the answer to any scattering is the just shall live by faith. Amen. Any problem of humanity will start with your faith on your part, on God's mercy on his part. By the way, I noted Brother Gibbons uh, says, high time we quit complaining about why me, Lord? What happened? What have I done? <laughs> They need to read that Habakkuk. And he mentioned there it was a lack of faith. And that scripture can well show that. God is telling us then in the scatterings that there is a gathering. As sure as you're scattered in Adam, the consequence of being in Christ is a gathering together. In him and by him. In him here, by him when he returns. This theme is consistent throughout all of the Bible. Ever since the Edom fall, God's people, while in this world, ever since Adam and Eve fell, God's people in this world, in the flesh, are never where God wants them to be. At no time. Eventually, you're not even here tonight is where God eventually wants you to be. We are still scattered in the flesh. In that sense, I don't care whether they were in Babylon or whether they were in Egypt or even when they got to Jerusalem or even if you were in Crown Point, you are not eventually where God wants you to be. To that extent, you are scattered and he has promised you a gathering. This theme is so consistent. Here, we are conduct our lives in an exemplary fashion, function as obedient strangers. See, a stranger not where he needs to be. A sojourner, he's not where he's going, realizing that our citizenship is in heaven. See, if our citizenship's there, that's where we belong. Our trust is never in the here. It's always in the there. It's, the trust is there because that's where God is, our Savior and our high priest. But their promise is always before us. I will gather you together. Now, Jeremiah stressed these principles over and over and over again. I suppose if one wasn't interested, he could nearly get bored about Jeremiah going over the scatterings by God and the gatherings together with him. Now, I want to read to you just a little letter, personal letter, that Jeremiah wrote to some of his brothers that had been scattered into Babylon. He says, this is the text of the letter that prophet Jeremiah sent to Jerusalem to the surviving elders that had been carried into exile. 
Exiles are scattering, by the way. This is what the Lord God Almighty, God of Israel, says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem, Babylon. It's very practical. Very practical for you today. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage that they too may have sons and daughters, increase in number, do not decrease, seek peace, seek prosperity, pray for the city that I've carried you into exile, pray to the Lord, because if it prospers it, you too will prosper. Wonderful practical applications of living in this world. This is what the Lord says, now when the 70 years are completed, I, God, will come to you. I'll fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I like that. By the way, then he just waxed eloquent in poetry just to back this up. That's just a letter. But then he starts writing the poetry to make all these uh, things come to uh, paint a beautiful picture of it. Don't ever mistake that Jer uh, Jeremiah is just simply chastising the people and prophesying against them to send them into a captivity to scatter them into the captivity. You miss the point. That's only half the story. The rest of the story is that God can, God will, and God wants to gather his people back together, a rebellious people from unseemingly impossible circumstances. Does that sound like what Christ has done with us? Amen. Absolutely. So don't think it's strange that God can take us also by Jesus, gathering us to himself. Early on, Jacob leaned upon his staff while he was in an exile and scattering himself into that Egyptian bondage. And he told Judah that it would be your descendant, Judah, of which it would be said, and to him shall be the gathering of his people. God be praised. Now I'd like to just review here a few notable scatterings in Scripture. You're familiar with most of them, that's quite okay. The time was early in the history of man. The place was the Garden of Eden, the problem, the old serpent, and man revolted against God. The consequence, therefore, the Lord says, send them out from the garden. He drove the man out. Scattering started pretty early in man's history. Now it's critical to note there's a real principle here that's proclaimed here throughout the scriptures. It remains constant till the final revelation. God proclaimed before the scattering took place, he proclaimed the remedy for the gathering. And here he gathered them together and preached the gospel to them that the seed of woman was promised by him who cannot lie. And so we got the remedy uh, for the root causes of scattering. Now later on in history, not too much later, but some later, the place was called Babel. The cir circumstance, they wanted to build a tower, they wanted to build a city. Listen to this, their words come, let us build ourselves a city. Wrong heart, wrong thought, wrong mind, compare that to faithful Abraham who looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Ah, yeah. uh, let me tell you what God thought about that heart. So the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. And on and on it goes through scripture. Now we had the scattering of the exile of the Egyptian bondage. Of course, that was foretold, both the scattering and the gathering back over 400 years later. Much of the Old Testament scriptures, of course, and the New Testament refers to that. Well, we had the scattering of the ten tribes, of course, that has been mentioned today. We had the scattering into the Babylonian captivity, well documented, especially by so many of the prophets. But the scattering and the gathering was both talked about. Jeremiah just uses these kind of phrases time after. I will scatter them, says God through Jeremiah. I will bring them back, you know, the next chapter. Sometimes it says, I will take them to Babylon, and there they're going to stay 
until I come get them. So these principles are just full of in, in the Bible. That diaspora, of course, of the Jews after the rejection of Christ. But our own bondage is into the weak and beggarly elements of the world. That was quite a scattering itself. You know, one time our circumstance was being without God in this present world, without hope, strangers to the covenant of promise. That's a real serious scattering. Now, even now, though, even I must emphasize that even now, since our citizenship is in heaven and I'm entrapped in the flesh, flesh and blood, I remain severely scattered because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we've had some testify that the, sometimes they feel just, I'm out of place. Well, this is the scattering. See, how's God going to gather if we're not scattered in that sense? So God is going to solve those problems, of course, in the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, of course, those prophets just had beautiful words. I myself would gather the remnant of my flock out of the nations. And we're very pleased that God is going to gather us out of our flesh, as has been preached to. Now, there, in, one could study these scatterings and, uh, from a historical point of view and just have fun with it. Uh, but to me, just a light study of them yields great principles of God. Both scattering and gathering are simply demonstrations of God's righteousness, and we need to remember that. Amen. Don't ever fuss when God scatters. That's a demonstration of His righteousness. He is just in scattering, and He is just in His gathering. Paul, of course, expressed this principle that He remains just in justifying us. Now, the demonstration of God's power to gather is reached its highest degree in the gospel, of course. For it's in the gospel that enabled God to gather together all things in Christ, both in heaven and in earth. Ephesians 1.10, as you well know. So Jesus, then, is the summation of our gathering. I would say he's the epitome of the gathering. Now, when, you, uh, when the writer uh, Paul to the Thessalonians said, in the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, and our gathering together to him. Most interesting that that word in its noun form is only found twice in the New Testament. And of course, it is the epitome of a gathering is what we're saying here. So that's that final reckoning. It's that final gathering. There will be no more gatherings after that gathering. We won't go no more in and out. See, in and out is just another word for scattering and gathering. So here, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. This is the epitome of gatherings. There is, an, there is one more gathering that uh, I might talk to you about that's happening here even tonight. You know, when the uh, scriptures, uh, Hebrews 10, 25, says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, that's really not forsake the gathering of yourself together. By the way, that same word, the final gathering and that gathering happened to just be the same Greek word. I don't know anything about Greek. I just know it's an epic gathering. It's a good gathering. It's an important gathering. It's the gathering by God here on this earth. That's the gathering by Jesus to take us uh, to uh, heaven itself. Uh, so this a very unique gathering that we're talking about. We sing a song at home. Uh, what a gathering that will be. Bro uh, Brother Given, he, he and I sung it together in mostly hard, if nothing else. He, he knew the words of it. Even the Jewish high priest in Jesus' time prophesied that there would be a gathering to gather into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. Amen. Now, so God's, God's behind gathering and scatterings. But there are gatherings without God and none good. I can find no good in any gathering that God's not there. Uh, just, just if God's not there, get out. Amen. There was a gathering in the Garden of Eden there. 
You know, the serpent and Adam and Eve got together. You think God was there when they decided to eat of the fruit, forbidden fruit? You think God was there? Of course not. He was not there when they decided to eat of the fruit. Now, we've been paying for that gathering ever since. And if you think you've paid, what's heaven paid? Amen. If God's not in a gathering, avoid it. Psalms 2, Acts 4 says, The kings of the earth gather together against the Lord and his anointed one. God's not in those gatherings. Psalms 4, the enemies of God gather iniquity in their heart against him. Paul experienced this on occasion. Acts 17, jealous Jews got gathered together, for the mob and rioted against him. Revelation 19, the beasts and kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against our Savior. Don't get in gatherings where God's not. Amen. A gathering of divided hearts and minds was so detrimental that Paul told the Corinthians that your gatherings do more harm than good. And have we ever seen that in the church? I don't believe that's what Hebrews had in mind, 1025. Jesus just tersely summed it up in Matthew 12. He that gathered not with me scattereth and just left it at, at that. Really, you know, without God <laughs> at a gathering, it's a scattering. That's what's taking place. Principle, another principle gathered uh, that I've learned from this is that gathering with God and his people always serve worthy purposes. Again, I hate to go back to that gathering of God after Adam and Eve have eaten of the truth of the forbidden fruit, God gathered them together. See, they, they first kind of wanted to avoid him, but he gathered them together and preached the gospel to them. And I tell you, I can just sense that that's the only hope that Eve carried with her the hundreds of years or however long she lived. That's presumption on my part. I understand that every Jewish woman in ancient history looked forward to possibly having that son that would be the Messiah. Uh, that gathering by God produced that kind of fruit in those lives. <clears throat> Psalms 147, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. And then it says, well, what's going to happen, God? Well, I'm going to heal the brokenhearted and bind their wounds. See, when he gathers, good things take place. Amen. So, you know, Antioch had a glorious gathering when the people heard the news that the gospel was open to the Gentile world. As prophesied by Isaiah, mentioned here tonight, God gathers the exiles from Israel and he gathers still others. I haven't been that still others, but I'm proud of that. I'm glad that I'm to be gathered. The church was gathered together to hear a report and was encouraged by the message in Acts 15, 7. The, see, and again, we mentioned Hebrews 10, 25. Don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. The purpose of that gathering is for edification and exhortation. Always good things when God is involved in the gathering. And again, Jesus says, summing it all up, even now he gathers the crop for eternal life so that the sower and may reaper may be glad to gather. Now look, in this matter of gatherings and good gatherings and bad gatherings with God and without God, the choice is always yours. See, Adam and Eve hid first. They decided, well, we're going to hide out over here. We don't want to be in that gathering when God comes along the choice. Noah chose to walk with God in righteousness and God gathered him and his family in the safety of the ark. Jesus said, how often would I have gathered you together, but you would not. It's not that I won't gather, it's that you would not. That's pretty interesting here. Look, I'm scattered enough. We use the old term scattered brain, but uh, we're, and, and that's true. <laughs> but we've had some testimonies this week of people feeling scattered. Uh, it's all right if you feel ill at ease in this body. That's what you're going to be gathered from. Amen. We're unfit for citizenship here. You should feel ill at ease. Methinks hell is an epi-scattering. 
as heaven is the epi gathering. Amen. Now concerning our gathering together to him. I want to praise the brethren for their elucidation on all of their scriptures. And rarely did one of you use the term gathering and you saved my whole speech. <laughs> but just focus on that a moment as we conclude now concerning our gathering together to him. To him. Focus on the him. And you'll be all right in the gathering. Matthew 2, 6. For out of Judah will come a ruler. Fulfillment of Micah. We've had that today. But it says the ruler will be the shepherd of my people. What does the shepherd do? He gathers the flock together. Yeah. Even as Jacob prophesied that Judah would do. I wondered how in the world God would take Amos, a shepherd, to send him to talk to kings. How did God take David, a shepherd, to rule his people? Let me tell you what a shepherd knows about scattering and about gathering. God loved his shepherds. And Jesus is the great shepherd. That means he's going to... He understands what it is for you to be scattered. He understands what you are in the body. He intends to gather you out of that. So Amos could talk to kings and David could rouse his nation to its greatest height. And here Jesus is called our shepherd, the shepherd of the prophecies, the son of God. Our response to this, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Why? Because his reward is with him. He tends the flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries him close to his heart. We are his glory. We are his pride. We are his joy, just as he is ours. I want to share together with you God's assessment in the prophets of this gathering, of the gatherer, and those of us to be gathered, revealed principally in his prophets. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep. I'll look for them. I'll rescue them from all the places where they've been scattered. And I'm going to bring them to their land. I'm going to save my flock. I'm going to be their God. And my servant will be prince among them. You know who that servant is. I've, I've spoken. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned. It is coming. It will surely take place. This is the day that I've spoken. And on Ezekiel goes. And on and on to delineate the great in great detail the inheritance of God's gathered people. Ezekiel titled it this way. The Lord is there. He has gathered us unto himself. Isaiah weighed in on this wonderful gathering. God weighs in through Isaiah. You understand what I mean. I have gathered you from the ends of the earth. I have chosen you and not rejected you. I am your God. Be not dismayed. Probably a song could be written about that. I will strengthen you. You will rejoice in glory in the Holy One of Israel. He is my servant whom I am uphold. You are precious and honored in my sight. And I love you. You know... I know that's talking about Jesus, but I know it's talking about me if I'm in Amen. Jesus. Amen. Don't, I have no fine theological knife to rightly divide maybe these things. You are my precious and honored in my sight and I love you. So I'm going to bring your children from the east and I'm going to gather them from the west. I'm going to bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. I'm going to gather everyone who's called by my name. After all, I created them for my glory. Paul picked up on these themes wonderfully to the Thessalonians. I have revealed, I have saved, I have proclaimed. Paul, that's what he told Timothy. And God just went out and revealed the gospel and saved the folks. Now let's preach about it. I like that. Now I'm going to take you home. 
going to take you home. And you can't take this out of my hand, says God. Yes, you like sheep were scattered. But Jesus was pierced for our iniquities, crushed for our transgressions. That righteous servant will justify many. He will see his offspring. For he will return. And we will, of course, see him. But he wants to see you as much as you want to see him. The law, the will of the Lord will prosper, and it is his will that we be gathered together by him. In him here, by him then. Amen. So arise, shine, for your light has come. The Lord is risen. Above you all that are gathered, come to him. Sons from afar, daughters on his arm, look, be radiant. Let your heart throb and swell with joy. He's endowed you with splendor. The sun and the moon no longer needed. He's the everlasting light. Possess it. Now you are the eternal display of my splendor. If we're the eternal display of his splendor, i got to believe that he is and will finally remove the one thing that is not neither his splendor nor mine is that's my vile body. But he says of this, I will not keep silent. For your sake I will not remain quiet. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord. Amen. What a gathering that will be. This is how God assessed it in his holy prophets. I tell you, I talked about my lovely wife that's brought me joy for 42 and a half years. God's prophets had to suffer so, so much because they had to understand what it was to gather sheep together. They had to sense where people hurt and they had to sense where God hurt. Amen. Can you imagine Hosea, the suffering that he went to in his marriage, to know what it felt like, what God had to feel like. God's people were dying, and Jerusalem was as good as dead. So God took the joy of Ezekiel's life. He says, tonight she dies. You're going to know what I feel like, and the people are going to know what you feel like. They're going to lose everything. Ezekiel had this great consolation that God gathered. And God could bring his wife back. That's us. And Ezekiel no doubt believed. Because he never complained about it. In scripture. No doubt Ezekiel knew. That he would bring her back to. In even a more highly lofted position. God praised the prophets for their sensitivity. Amen. And God opened my heart to the fact that you want me and you're going to return to get me. So I, with my other brethren, say, Lord, come quick.